I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor at Gold Derby here with Jeff Zanelli, who is the composer for Showtime's The First Lady. And, and you know, Jeff, I have to imagine that when you're tackling something like this, where you're covering over a century of, of history, um, that musically that has to be uh, kind of a daunting challenge. What was your reaction um, at having to cover that kind of span of time? It's, it's funny, now that you mention it, it's the second time I've done it, actually. Um, I, I scored a show called Into the West, which was about the settling of America, and that, too, was uh, almost 100 years. But um, yes, it's daunting for the, for the sort of different decades, and especially daunting because it's true stories about, you know, actual people. It's not, you know, fiction. So all of a sudden you're going, well, people's legacies are, in, are on the line, right? And what am I... You know, how do I support that? But just looking at it from, as you point out, the length of time that this show has to cover, um, kind of, you know, points to a certain approach with the music, which is to not necessarily aim for the different periods and write, you know, the 1930s for Eleanor and write 2008 for Michelle, but instead to, you know, look for all the ways that their stories connect, um, and and right to that. And so that was actually really part of the uh, challenge with the show of this scope, because it really is three separate stories. They never meet each other. They're never ever in a room together. Um, but there's obviously a reason why the three of them are all in one show. And that is because there's a shared experience. And, you know, I, I guess if, if I were to describe it, it's sort of like a river that you can keep returning to is this like undercurrent of the show while at the same time, obviously Betty has her own unique story compared to Michelle, compared to Eleanor. So it's just kind of like the yin and yang of the show. They're, they're unique um, individuals and unique stories. And then this kind of, again, the river that we come back to, which is the experience of being the first lady, which not that many women have actually had, you know. So from a from a musical perspective, how do you? I've, I'm always fascinated by by how composers you know kind of get that inspiration. So mm -hmm. and when you're trying to hit, tackle something that handles this many different uh, time periods, and, but still has this through line of an experience, where where does the inspiration come from? Well, I'm, you know, in a case like this, it's pretty easy to be inspired by the performances. You know, I mean, like I can't. I can't think of a composer that wouldn't want to get a phone call from someone saying we have Viola Davis and Gillian Anderson and Michelle Pfeiffer in a show, you know, so there's, there's already that and the way that they inhabit and, you know, perform their roles is, is extraordinary. I'm sure, you know, well, you can see the reaction to it. People are responding. Um, that's inspiring. And I think, um, you know, funny enough, I'm not, I'm not really a history buff. I'm a, I'm a, story buff and I'm a character buff and that's what I'm interested in so I, that's what kind of grabs me and I especially like Betty's story for her she's the one that really has more of a kind of a redemption arc because she sometimes it's circumstance and sometimes it's choices that she makes that you know created some difficulties in her life we know she was an addict we know that she eventually opened a clinic and helped people we know that she got breast cancer recovered and helped women you know, start taking more control and have more agency in their healthcare. That story to me is timeless and, you know, equally relevant now as it was, well, you know, at any point. So, you know, that's, that's inspiring. Um, and then of course we know Michelle Obama because it's so present. It, it sort of just happened, right? So we know what the Hunger Free Kids Act was. We know that, um, you know, marital rights changed substantially when she was in office with her, well, when her husband was in office. So these are all, it's hard not to find inspiration in those, in those things, you know, those are all progress. Those are all good things for, you know, humanity, for Americans, for, and for the ladies themselves. So. When I, when I spoke to, uh, to the director, Susanna Beer, um, yeah. she, she was basically talking about the, the challenge of basically sculpting three separate movies and then intertwining them. So I'm curious, did you tackle them separately initially? And which one was the first one that you tackled? Actually, no, not really. Um, it's, it's funny you say that. By the time I started to see the show, it was really edited, at least roughly, 
the way it's being aired. You know, it, they were the stories were intertwining the way they are, and the you know I think some scenes may have moved from one episode to another, but the idea of the stories being you know separate was already in place, and um, you know part of it was really on a case by case basis when you're moving from one lady to another in the narrative how how are we using music to either connect or in some cases you know show the differences between those two stories there's a lot of times the music is starting with one lady and finishing with another and so there's a transitional element about it and that is part of what i think um is the fabric of the show is using the music and you know and the way they edited it but really it's the music's job to go you know this part of the story has accrued to this point and it is handing off now to Eleanor's story, handing off now to Michelle. Um, so I think a lot of what Susanna was talking about with you is work that she did prior to me needing to score the show. And I think what my work with her was actually much more, um, I would say more macro than a usual director composer relationship. And by that, I mean, she didn't really, feel the need to weigh in on every second of music or every cue and in fact i learned pretty quickly I, just sending her one scene didn't really help her to understand or not, not understand to help her to you know see the project through she really wanted to look at the big picture so what i ended up doing um was i would score an entire episode before i showed her any music so this is what this hour looks like and she could watch the whole thing through and Susanna has an interesting way of working it's um and I'm it's sort of hard to describe but I think she knows better than a lot of other directors how much you know changing the music back here in the first 10 minutes of the show affects what happens 50 minutes later so she doesn't need to or want to zoom in on individual moments she wants to take the whole thing in and her um her uh I guess uh, guidance when we're working on the score together was much more you know broad strokes it's sort of like look if we're going to use the river analogy if you put a giant stone at the head of the river the whole thing diverts you know and and you don't even and you would need a much bigger stone to make it divert that much down line so she was very very clever and smart about seeing you know the forest for the trees she never lost sight of that you know you can i'm an english teacher you can make as many you know <laughs> as many analogies and, as you can make as many analogies <laughs> and metaphors as you want i'm i'm here for it um <laughs> you're speaking my language um i'm also i'm 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 also kind of a a, a fan of 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 orchestration and and instrumentation mm -hmm. so in covering the, the i guess there might have been was there an impulse ever to like you know make the three time periods sound totally different, like using instruments from one period versus another. I, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, you know what? A very little, um, a little bit, because I think, I think there's a danger in, you know, look, if you were to look at it broadly and go, okay, we're gonna use a kind of a, an antiquated sound for Eleanor Roosevelt. We're gonna use a six, I mean, I would love to use a 60s sound for everything. It's a colorful era for music for, um, you know, for Betty in the 70s. And then we have to use, you know, contemporary music for Michelle. But I think what what ends up happening is, first off, the score would become a little bit, I think, difficult to track. Um, and second, the, it starts to feel like you're taking sides in a way. Like, in other words, why are we giving Eleanor a certain sound when she's, equally powerful to Betty, to Michelle, you know, why does Michelle have to have, you know, I guess eventually I came across, I came to the idea that it really should be more merged and that where we could do that is actually more with the songs that were licensed, which obviously is separate from what I do, but Sue Jacobs was the music supervisor and she did a fabulous job of using the music to really differentiate time periods. So in other words, my score, um, rather quickly oriented itself more toward character and intimacy and, you know, specificity really, which I think is, um, well, <laughs> if I'm being blunt, I think it's lacking in a lot of other productions and, and in, not in this one. So like, in other words, I don't think you can take my music from the first lady and put it in another historical drama and have it work. I don't think that'll happen. I don't think it will. I think it works for Eleanor, 
Betty, Michelle, as performed by our amazing cast. So, you, but that said, you know, there's a few nods to Betty does get sometimes some 60s and 70s sounds, electric keyboards and things like that. Um, Michelle does occasionally get, um, you know, she even talks about the music that she likes. She's from Chicago. She's, you know, so there's a little bit of that in there, but it was never, I was never trying to be overt with that, you know. Um, the in talking to a lot of composers, you know, I love to hear about the actual music making because I think you know people have kind of the stereotypical idea that that music is is you know recorded in a studio and and right. with a big group of players. And of course, COVID has changed all of that. It has, um, and, and technology has changed all of that. So, so mm -hmm. how do you? How, how, how was the music created for this? Sure. Well, okay, so um, that's funny you say that. In the very, very early stages, I thought, oh, we're going to need an orchestra. We started looking around, you know, how many players, you know, in, look, I've done enormous orchestras for Maleficent with 110 musicians at Abbey Road. That was not the scale that felt appropriate here. But at one point I did look into maybe 30 musicians or something. Um, but funny enough, the deeper I got into it, the more I realized, actually, it, no, it, this is about individuals. So I want to hear a smaller group. I want to hear less, you know, you can do a lot with just a piano. If, if you've, if, if you follow the show, the end of episode five, one of the, to me, one of the cornerstone scenes in the entire series is scored with a solo piano. So that's me hunched over, honestly, right at the limits of my ability of piano playing. But it's vulnerable, intimate music. It's very um, specific, again. And so that's what that scene needed. You know, in the earlier episode, for instance, when the Obamas first move or go to the White House, I mean, he's been elected, they're about to move in. It's a much bigger scene. There's hundreds of people outside. It's a huge historical event that has a much larger size to it. And, th and there, there were the 30 or so um, string players to kind of have that size. But for the vast majority of it was five or so string players recorded individually because we have a pandemic. So they have to be done a different way than we used to. And then that's augmented by um, pianos and um, vibraphones and you know marimbas and other instruments that uh, synthesizers and guitars that I bring into the score. So, but just to your point though, it, there was a certain, scale that felt oppressive against some of this um, footage and so we weren't really going to be able to this show wouldn't tolerate it you know the show tells you what it wants it wants intimacy so. and I, I think that's that that intimacy is so key I think to why the show works mm -hmm. um, but and you've scored so many different types of projects you mentioned into the west which you know has kind of this almost epic feel to it yes and, much bigger but, stuff. but then you also have these kind of smaller moments and so I'm wondering as a composer is it more difficult to compose something on a larger scale or are the intimate moments more difficult or no I <laughs> would say the intimate moments are actually more challenging so what thing that happens is you know if you're if you only have a piano and you know you only have a piano i mean my blood pressure just went up saying that you know it, it's a little nerve-wracking there's nothing to hide behind you know and on top of that i was the piano player <laughs> and i know better piano players than me but i don't know um any that would sit around for three hours at two in the morning to play one cue over and over until it sounded right. Do you, do you know what I mean? So I have to do that myself. So there's a certain, um, I don't know, handmade quality almost to what, what I think this score is. And I, I love it for that. When there's a big sound, <laughs> you have more to hide behind. You know, Into the West had the orchestra, but it also had Lakota music. It also, you know, we had a lot of different styles and things to draw from. Here, we're drawing literally from, you know, small, little people, big problems. It's very, very person focused, not people focused. It's, you know, it's so, so often about one person or two people, their relationship. And so, um, yeah, it's, I find it much more difficult to write that intimate music. It's, you know, rewarding as well, but difficult. <laughs> what is it about, you know, you brought up something interesting, but that, that you know better piano players, but, yeah. but you're, 
but, but you're the one that is literally creating the notes and creating right. the music. What is it about? What is it about you that that is that it has the ability to do that? A lot of people don't. Right. No, I think it's it's an interesting thing to think about, and especially you know this is a much broader topic than what we're <laughs> than what we're supposed to be talking. But you know the just the rise of technology allows almost anybody to be a composer, but it doesn't allow almost anybody to be a, or to deliver a great performance of music, right? That's what we rely on musicians for. There's a reason why I hired string players. I can't, I couldn't do it, you know, um, and they can, and you can produce them and you can create together. And I love that collaboration. But for, you know, the scene I'm talking about in episode five is um, Betty, after she has a mastectomy, she's about to look at herself for the very first time in the mirror. The mirror scene. Yep. And it's built up. First off, she already knows she's been in the hospital. She's come to the window. Hundreds of people have cheered for her. She's received the letters. She's already changed the face of American healthcare, right? Because people are now, I'm getting mammogram. I'm taking care of myself in a way I didn't. It was, this was a huge event really for American healthcare, but she still has this very intimate moment, which is, I have to go look at what, what, what am I now? you know, and there's, and it's incredibly devastating, you know, I, in fact, in, um, I spoke with a woman who had had a mastectomy before I did this cue, um, and she was very kind to explain to me what it was like, you know, and not that I needed that conversation because Michelle Pfeiffer's performance is extraordinary, but those things all kind of fuel a performance, and so it's a whole lot different from here's some sheet music, play the notes, it's actually you know, take on some amount of that, that, of that emotion, you know, take on that, that burden and try to express it, right, so that, to me, kind of transcends technical ability, it doesn't really, you know, it's not that hard to play the note in the right time, you know, um, but it, it is hard to play the note uh, in an expressive way that kind of fuels the story, right, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly could have hired a piano player and sat with them and done it for th three hours, you know, and I don't know that the result would have been any better because, you know, I, that was very much internalized as much as I could, you know, do it and then performed to picture right here, you know, in front of it. And so those, those are, you know, I, I knew that that was going to be a moment that was meaningful to a large part of our audience. And, um, yeah, not lost on me that there's actually a burden attached to that. So, yeah. Well, it's a burden you handled beautifully. Um, um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, <laughs> and uh, stay tuned uh, for interviews with more contenders uh, throughout the season. Jeff Sinelli from The First Lady, uh, great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so Likewise, much. Likewise, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>